It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Sarah Caples and Everardo Jefferson tonight. Uh, Sarah and Everardo together lead the practice Caples Jefferson Architects based in Long Island City in the awesome borough of Queens, just saying. Um, they founded the practice in 1987 following their graduation from architecture school. And since then, the practice has been focused on design for the public and the public good. Their projects include multifamily residential, urban design and infrastructure, offices, community and religious centers, schools, and I mean schools, pre-K, preschool, K to eight, high school, community colleges and universities. Um, and they have also done theaters, museum spaces and exhibition design. So work at many scales and for many program types, much of it in and around the city of New York. Everardo received his BA in industrial design from the Pratt Institute and a Master of Architecture from Yale. He has served on the board of the Family Justice Center, the board of the New York chapter of the AIA, and he is currently on the board of Neighborhood Charter Schools, and he is also a member, and I think this might be in some ways a noble but thankless task, of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Sarah received her BA from Smith College and her Master of Architecture from Yale, and she has taught at CCNY, Syracuse University, the University of Miami, and of course, Yale University. Many Voices, Architecture for Social Equity, their new book, I'm sorry, I don't have a copy here to hold up, uh, came out in December. In 2017, the firm won the AIA New York President's Award. In 2012, they were awarded the New York State Architecture Firm of the Year Award, and their <clears throat> design work, excuse me, has received numerous, numerous awards, too many to count, including from the Chicago Athenaeum American Architecture Award, the 2010 New York Construction Cultural Project of the Year Award, a Queens, here we are again, Chamber of Commerce Award, the National Organization of Minority Architects National Award for Excellence in Architecture, as well as a Masterworks Award for Best Restoration from the Municipal Arts Society of New York. The work has also been widely published in the Architects newspaper, the New York Daily News, the Wall Street Journal, that's an extreme, uh, the New York Times, Oculus, Architect Magazine, Architect, and of course, Paprika. Um, so please join me in welcoming Sarah Caples and Everardo Jefferson for their lecture entitled Erasing Invisibility. So glad you guys are here. You want to introduce it together, and then I'll take people through the tour of the yeah. buildings well, and then Q&A. Let me just say thank you for the invitation. And it's always a delight, a trepidation, to come to this place of memories for me. Uh, it's, a, it's a place of personal, um, it's personal place. Great. Well, so I don't have anything to add to that. So, um, oh, sorry. I, I'm going to move away slightly just because I seem to be creating sound buzz. Um, we've been doing this work for over 30 years. I just have to figure out how to advance the slide. Uh, I, I'm good at one finger screen press. Um, and we started working before we really had a theory about what we were doing. Uh, we just knew that we wanted to work in neighborhoods where people didn't seem to be represented and where the architecture didn't seem related to its occupants. We wanted to bring our buildings and their audience into a closer relationship. One of the things we kept on bumping up against was that the particular set of architectural training and tools that we possessed created a distinct aesthetic that didn't always connect 
with the dreams and the ambitions of the people that we were working with. To connect our architecture to our users' aspirations, their hopes, their experiences, we had to broaden our own architectural tool chest of techniques. And we came to realize that we were making apparent things and people that are too often hidden. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, fortunately, there's a wonderful person up there who is uh, better at this than I am. Uh, there's much in New York that isn't really visible. Even people can seem invisible. Every night, there's an army of people dressed like this who deliver millions of dinners. And yet, most recipients don't stop to know them. They don't have any idea where they live or how they live, their stories, how they came to be here. And even in their own neighborhoods, there is very little, save maybe a few shop signs, to acknowledge their unique presence. Next slide, please. And the person who started to give us a way to think about what we're doing, he's dying here in the <laughs> second row, it was our son, Esteban Jefferson, who is a painter, obviously. Uh, and his work is largely about redirecting the gaze. Uh, here he's uh, painting flags that people spontaneously taped to stop signs to assert their identities in the neighborhoods where they live. And next. And here he paints a bust. Next slide, please. And here he paints a bust that's not even created, that's not even credited. Oh, Deborah's going to bail me out here. Oh my gosh. See that little arrow? Magic. That should do Thank it. you. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Well, well, we'll see you in a minute. Uh, I'm just going to go back and forward. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. So this, what your gaze is being directed to here is he paints a bust that's not even credited. It's merely called Bust of an African by the museum that displays it at the Petit Palais in Paris. But he redirects your gaze to ask, who was this? What was this about? And so looking at our son's paintings, even though we had been doing this work for a long time, it opened up a way of thinking about it, of clarifying for us what we were doing. So erasing invisibility, trying to create projects that connect with people's experiences to let them know that they are part of the civic life, that they contribute to, We'd like to share with you some of this work, how it evolved, but also some of our mistakes in interpretation and how we healed them, and a few specific architectural techniques that we found to be useful in, the, in that development. And this first project is a case in point. Uh, we did a tenant space in this old theater uh, that was on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. And this was a time when the drug caravans would come out every night at 4.30 and drive down the Grand Concourse. They could not be mistaken because the cars were so different. And the neighborhood was very disrupted. And we were, in, we were engaged to create a preschool for children with full-blown AIDS. And uh, this was before the medical techniques to uh, help those situations had been found. And so for those of you who are students, you can think of like the beginning of COVID as, as you can connect 
pretty easily to what that meant. Um, and we, we knew we didn't want to kind of create a, a stereotypical image of a uh, three primary color school, but we didn't have a way of really accessing what would connect with the families. And one of the things that helped us was that the, the director told us that we really needed to kind of calm down the palette and make it uh, calming because for many of these children and their families uh, who had many members who were ill, their lives were very disrupted and the school, uh, albeit in an abandoned burlesque office, was a, a, a refuge. And very often, when we, hear, when we first hear from people about what they're looking for, as hard as we try to listen, we don't really hear. We've had this experience again and again that it takes repeated efforts. And then at some point, there's kind of a breakthrough where we start to understand our mistaken preconceptions that were preventing us from seeing and in that moment of breaking through, that's where the work becomes deeper and uh, hopefully uh, more interesting. So this is a typical project from sort of the beginning of our career. Uh, it's called Heritage. Um, it was a social service agency in central Harlem. And uh, Heritage were very proud that they had acquired this garage and that they wanted to turn it into a beacon in the neighborhood and a social services agency for people who were just coming out of prison and who generally had a witch's brew of substance abuse and mental health problems. And so uh, one of the things we decided to do was to change the identity of the garage and we started to clad it and we worked with a wonderful artist named Nathan Slate Joseph because, as Everardo says, no architecture project is a sole artist production. It's always made by a group. And so we'll mention some of our collaborators as we go along, but it, you have to know that every project is, is uh, many, many hands. Uh, and so Nathan made this beautiful sketch for our clients because we asked him to do the entire facade installation. Um, and when our clients saw this, they didn't kind of realize that it was all green and blue because I guess they saw that light and they thought. But then uh, at midnight, one night, we got a call from the executive director, a wonderful woman named Ana Pereira, who called us and said, darlings, it's a disaster, which is very New York. Uh, and, and so we said, well, I don't know, what's the disaster here at, you know, 11.58 at night or whatever it is? And she said, I don't know what we were thinking. It's, this is all green and blue. And the, for our his, mainly Hispanic neighborhood, those are kind of colors of depression. And our, our, uh, Clients have to see something that brings them in. And so Nathan was so cool and so flexible. He rushed out, and here's Nathan in the front, and Everett and I are kind of lurking behind there in this photo for the New York Times. Uh, and he came back with all these orange and yellow and red panels. And they came back, and they were like, yeah, 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 it's a patchwork, like us. We love it. So. Uh, Making this, making architecture that spoke to someone's conditions, it it really takes these kind of reboots sometimes, where we think we know what we're doing and we think we're communicating, but there's still so much to be bridged, and not and and it, so the agency eventually moved out and they left the facade to rust. And very strange, this picture off of Google Earth, it became a fashion icon, and they, like Nike shoots and things take place until, you know, apparently this will be torn down to be replaced with a building like the one 
you see in construction behind it. But of course the facade, as we all know, is just part of the building. And here you see a diagram where the facade is that little dot to the left, lower left. And the real thing was that this whole building was landlocked. And we wanted to bring natural light into a building that was uh, old and moldy. And we wanted to bring light even down to the uh, basement. And so we had big debates. We made these kind of light, lamps of light, of daylight, that it cut into the building in four locations. And we had these big debates over whether the skylight should act like a floodlight, be long and linear, or act like spotlights and be square and just have the light bounce around. And we ended up with the spotlights, and that turned out to really work with, these, with this cheap plastic diffusing material that we used because our clients were really too poor to afford glass. Uh, but it, it, they could track where the light was in the course of the day. And you'll see that that had great meaning for them. And of course, these things glow differently. And we wanted to make sure that they could understand the operation of the light, and so we created these slots so they could really see how the light was coming in as they walked down the corridor. And even in the basement, which had been moldy, as soon as the light was introduced, it healed all of the mold in the building. Uh, of course, we had a D whatever uh, out the wazoo, but the, the smell and the presence of it really disappeared with the daylight. Um, and even at sunset, they, at, at toward the, after the project was complete, one of the directors came to us and said, well, you don't know this, but we stop every day at this certain moment of sunset uh, because their concern was they wanted a place, they told us, they wanted a place that responded to their spirituality, that that's what drove them to work with the people who were their clients. And so having that moment each day of that sunlight, that particular moment, they would just kind of stop and meditate. So it, it's interesting when you let people take you into their journeys where you can end up. And one of the things that we found that wasn't really uh, something that people were encouraging us to do in school, although there was a lot of discussion in the architectural community, uh, especially in the 80s, but narrative turns out to be extremely important to many, many of our clients. And they approach things with a narrative and they want to see a story reflected. And we, we did a series of theoretical projects uh, at the turn of the century, and one of them was this proposal for the Martin Luther King Memorial on the Tidal Basin. And so besides using Georgia mar granite and all of these kind of things, we had, and, and each of these enclosures was a light box, which especially at night you would see, and you would walk along beside it and, and see the story of various things that Martin Luther King mm -hmm. did. But Really, we wanted to create narrative that brought you into a tactile experience of narrative. That, because we found that when people like the heritage, when they really feel something in their body, would then it becomes real to them and memorable to them. So here, we were creating a central space where you walked across an eighth of an inch of water because literally walking on water, as uh, in many ways we felt Martin did. And as we develop, we st so it's not always one culture or one dominant culture that we're working with in our borough of Queens, uh, our awesome, which in Queens we say awesome, uh, in our awesome borough, 
it's the most diverse uh, city in the United States with over 100 different, uh, or 200, I forget the number, it's something mind-blowing, different um, ethnic groups who still speak their original languages and part in their households. And so there's a collective mythology, however, in Queens about the World's Fair. And many people in Queens feel that the 1965 World Fair, who remembers that, or even an earlier one in 1930-something, uh, is in a way put their borough on the map. And so this, we were engaged to create, uh, to extend a theater which was housed in one of the remnants of the World's Fair. And the remnant was in the, in the New York State World's Fair Pavilion by Philip Johnson. And uh, he was very proud of it. It was on the cover of his own retrospective uh, book. And then at some point, they, they, there was a smaller building. There was this big arena. And then there was a smaller building which was called the Theaterama, and was had originally was a drum that you walked into, and you had a 360 projection, which was space age in '65, um, and that got transformed into a theater. And then we got brought we got brought in because there was no backstage, there was no there were no offices, there was a tiny lobby with these towers uh, that one of the wonderful, one of our collaborators uh, in our office, Juan Hay, called the uh, Mickey Mouse Ears. And somehow we had to recenter and realign this composition, this very axial composition, and try to play to its strengths and play to this World Fair myth. And so uh, we located our, we located a lobby that was also going to be the party room for the borough and the place of the borough president's annual reception. Uh, we located it on access with this big uh, arena so that as you approach the project, it was healed and recomposed along its original geometric intentions. And um, as often happens, our initial idea was a little dull and Everardo conducted a in-house competition for people to look at this sort of cylinder of the party room and see how to activate it. And our uh, then employee, now partner, Michael Berman, won the competition with this idea of having the approaches to the drum uh, be spirals. And, and uh, the workers, I loved it so much they nicknamed it the nebula, and now everybody in Queens calls it the nebula. Um, and so th this, we, Everardo was like, well, that's still too static. So then he said, instead of the ceiling being flat or domed, let's invert the dome. And so that's what we did. And so this is a, a, a sort of concept sketch of the experience of that place as the spirals and the lighting uh, all lead you into this place with the dome. And of course, here's a more conventional architectural expression of how that relates. And you can see there, there's this huge dissonance of scales. And of course, the, the big arena and the observation towers behind it had fallen into such desuetude, had fallen into such disrepair that they were threatened with demolition. And if you look at carefully at the circle of the nebula, you see these three dots, which are actually large skylights. And the skylights create not only a way for daylight to penetrate this inverted dome, and they're of course very angled and designed to bounce light and all of those things, but they're also designed to direct your gaze back up to the observation towers, to the fabric that needed to be renovated. 
And in our small way, we help to contribute to building a public for the renovation, which is now occurring. Um, and it's been painted and now it's being stabilized so that the structure will stand another, you know, 150 years or whatever uh, it is that uh, engineers designed to. So uh, it's really, it's interesting how architecture can really be an act of healing and contribute to a healing in narratives for a community. And of course, one of the things about the work that we do is we're always dealing with work that has generally very restricted budgets, and we have to create, and we have to use our architectural techniques, our tools, and our artistic training about gestalt perception. So, uh, for instance, here, this, this round shape we could only use flat pieces of glass for the glazing because there wasn't that much money to have curved glass. But Everardo had this idea using a gestalt idea. A team says Everardo, but he, he really came up with this particular idea of having these fins out uh, so that as your gaze goes round the corner, you're seeing the line of fins, uh, uh, they, foreshortening into space, and your mind is thinking curve rather than facets. And I think when you see the finished result, that those slight projections really do operate that way and create this idea of total roundness. And a cultural issue. So back to colors. Colors are charged not only with uh, calming or energizing effects, but very, very strong cultural associations. And when we first presented this to uh, a couple of user groups in Queens, we started to get very negative reactions about the white dome that we thought we would be a perfect reflector for different colored lights. And the reaction of many of the people that we spoke with, especially many um, people of Asian ancestry, was that this white was really a color of mourning. It was not a color of celebration to them. And so we started to do studies that looked at sort of brighter colors. And we, did, we started to do research about colors and the different meanings that different cultures map onto colors. And we finally found, uh, here is a construction photo while it's still white. And you can see kind of what people were talking about. Even though it, there's a lot of definition of light, um, it wasn't going to really have a positive impact for a lot of people. And here's where we ended up, with this golden color that is perceived as celebratory across an incredible spectrum of cultures. And of course, we also made sure that the lights were adjusted so that, that this gold would glow. And, and uh, we're, we're shameless stealers from art and painting. So we stole an idea from Rothko of having a color transition that was very soft at the edges so that the edges would be intensified but you're, if, if you don't notice things easily, you might not see it, but you would feel it. Its, it's visceral impact would be strong. And here we are as it telegraphs those intentions across the park. So then I'm coming to a project that we did um, in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. It's a part of Brooklyn where we came into a cross of all of these techniques and currents that I've been talking about, but with a specific kind of tectonics. And form and tectonics became a very big area of debate on this project. It's on the site 
of an African-American village that was started by free people uh, after slavery ended. And um, it was still very, very difficult for free African-Americans to purchase land. But somehow a group of people led by a longshoreman named James Weeks uh, banded together in a sort of cooperative and bought land that was not premium agricultural land in, agri in uh, Brooklyn. And they created a, a community that became known as Weeksville. And during, this is just a, as an architect, I always love this uh, story of how Weeksville was rediscovered. So in the 60s, as there was a, a, a movement among African Americans to increase knowledge of their own history and to bring to the fore knowledge that had been suppressed and forgotten. Researchers went to records in Brooklyn Historical Society and places like that to find out, to go through records and find out where African American settlements had been and to find out what was the real history. And so when they discovered Weeksville, one of these researchers got a friend of his who was a professor at Pratt and also an amateur helicopter pilot. And these two people flew over the part of Brooklyn where they knew Weeksville had been, and they saw these four houses off the grid. A classic Noli diagram discovery. And when they went down to the ground, they discovered people who were descendants of the Weeksville founders still living in the, some of these houses. And so they, they rediscovered it and it became a point of enormous pride in the neighborhood. And this wonderful woman named Joyce Maynard, who was a comic book illustrator and, and passionately interested in her heritage and created comic books about African American history for kids and all kinds of things. Joyce Maynard started a dime drive with the Cub Scouts to raise money to eventually she got uh, mobilized the whole city to purchase these houses and to uh, save them and restore them. And eventually the city bought the whole end of the block and so tenement houses that were subsequent to Weeksville um, and were in hugely poor condition in a neighborhood that was experiencing a lot of difficulties at that time were torn down. And so the view was revealed back. And our clients at Weeksville uh, were told us they really wanted a center that would not only continue to celebrate uh, Weeksville heritage, but they wanted very specifically, specifically because its rediscovery came out of an Afrocentric moment for the forms of our building to, to derive from West African architecture because West Africa was sort of the area where the diaspora took place. And so we had a lot of fun developing these forms and, and it was a kind of a joyous exercise with our clients. And we thought of different ways of cladding them in African wood and of, of tying also the buildings to the landscape. Um, and our clients were very excited about this and, and uh, um, I think we even won a, one of those NOMA awards for this particular design. And then we took it to the Public Design Commission of the City of New York. And the Public Design Commission rejected it out of hand. They said it was too assertive. They said that it competed with the historic architecture. And we actually had a little seminar after all our clients decided not to fire us, um, that said from uh, some of the city authorities showing us what they wanted. And they showed our clients slides of buildings by Sfera Fenn and Scarpa. 
and said, you need to produce this for an African-American heritage center. So that was kind of a jarring moment. But one of the sort of funny things was that Everardo, had, his training at Pratt, had been very centered around the inheritance of the Bauhaus. And so the idea of creating these sort of Eurocentric forms, it was kind of like he could do it in his sleep. Uh, it, well, of course, it took a lot more effort than that. But uh, so these were geometric forms. Uh, we pulled away so that the long view of the houses would be kept. We had always had a contextual height, uh, but we, we located the forms along, opened up at the end toward the houses, and then this other opening, the big entry, we put along an old road called Hunterfly Road, which was actually a subsequent uh, colonial development on top of an Indian trail. So a lot like those maps that you see at the beginning of each lecture, they, they, there's these different generations of people that made this land important. Um, and we took great care to create transparency along the side street. So even when you were coming down the side street, you would look in and see uh, what was going on in the site, uh, because there very often the intention was to have outside, outdoor celebrations. And the glazed spaces that were kind of a zipper between these solid forms uh, were meant to be gathering spaces in their own right. And so you can start to see the play of these forms. And even, uh, sorry, I popped through that a little fast. Uh, and even, of course, the responsibility to connect with cultures does not cancel the responsibility to be good stewards of the earth. Far from it. Our clients were very, very concerned that their building be responsible. And so, of course, it's powered by 50 geothermal wells and all kinds of things like that. Uh, it, it, it's very much oriented towards that future. But Everardo was not satisfied that we would uh, respond to what our clients wanted unless we came and found a way to reincorporate those ambitions in this different set of forms. And one of our colleagues, a wonderful woman named Audrey Sudu Raphael, had been studying African uh, architecture and African-American architecture for about 20 years and she had a kind of series of seminars in our office where we looked at architectural examples and also at art of this diasporic region. And Everardo started to say, well, all right, we're going to find a way to incorporate patterns. And our architect friends were all, that's a cliche, everybody will hate it, blah, 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 blah. You can, but we had to come to a moment of resistance to our own training, to the specifics of abstraction of our own training, and find a way to marry this desire for narrative and of visual cues, not just a verbal narrative, but a visual narrative uh, with the work. And we started to look at creating patterns, not just joinery of materials, although that was certainly part, but looking at recomposing the forms using colors out of this diasporic art and creating uh, three-dimensional uh, forms with the structure in the glass bridge and uh, even shadows. I'll show you in a moment. So here's the glass bridge, the glass gathering space, and you can see how this structure has been assembled that also speaks of a certain basket pattern. And as we're making this sustainable building and we're using different darknesses of glass in order to reduce the heat gain, that also gave us the opportunity to create these shadows, these these projections of the darkness on the floor that would be in one place when you came in and maybe a different place when you walked out. And even the frit, 
we, we worked with a wonderful colleague of ours, Tobina Saki, um, to design a frit that we based on a Congolese piece of fabric that actually was once owned by Matisse. Um, but they, they using this fabric to create a smaller scale of shadows on the frit rather than just generic dots. And even the fence that encircled the uh, site was, we created these custom pickets that would kind of rotate in space. We made a very flattened drawing because we were afraid the art commission would reject it if we showed them really how three-dimensional it was, but uh, uh, they accepted it, so we were okay. And here's how all of those intentions really played out architecturally. And so you can see the building opening up towards the historic village. You can see the materiality and closer up some of the joinery on this purple and green Vermont slate. You can see this entrance here along the old path that takes you in and even at night it has transparency through this bronze gate. And of course at the other end, we start to really open up the view. And even when you're walking along the side street, you can see through and you can see something's happening here. And then as you come in, uh, coming into the lawn and the landscape, you know, there's this wonderful uh, sculpture by Shakaya Booker uh, called Sugar in My Bowl. And uh, here we are on the grounds and looking back toward the neighborhood, it was as important to us when you're in the site to connect to the larger neighborhood as it was for the neighborhood to understand that something special was going on in the site. And here we are looking out from the multi-purpose room back in the glazed corridor and here you can see this frit casting its little shadows on the structure all of these whispers speaking to the users, framed views, and even when you're walking down the street, the shadows are whispering to you, inviting you in. And one of the beautiful things when you do connect, because these projects don't live if they're not owned, in their hearts by the people that use them is when they continue to make the project their own, when they continue to give it life. And so this was an installation made a couple of summers ago uh, with this great Octavia quote, Octavia Butler quote, paradise is one's own place, one's own people, one's own world. And the wonderful artists that created this also created a community project. And here are people making it and bringing it to the fence and installing it. And this is a neighborhood making this through art, still creating their own place and bringing their own narratives and layering them on. So I just have one last project that uh, where we tried to bring all of these things together. It's the Louis Armstrong Museum. It's going to open this summer. So it's still finishing construction and you'll see some of these photographs are really taken this week. Uh, it's a museum that's on a residential two-story uh, informal street in Corona, Queens, back to Queens. And it, that was one of the few neighborhoods where African-American performers could find homes to buy in the 30s and 40s. And uh, when Louis Armstrong, who actually was on the road over 300 days a year, his wife, while he was gone, went and bought a house for him in Corona. And this is the house. It's a very modest house because Louis Armstrong, despite being one of the world's revolutionary artists, 
uh, in jazz when he was young, uh, had, was very down to earth and very modest in what he wanted for a lifestyle and was, always wanted to be connected back to people in his neighborhood, to people in his world. And so this house has been turned into a house museum and people just go nuts when they go there. It's full of recordings, home recordings that he made and all kinds of special things. Um, and slowly the museum acquired a site across the street for an uh, education center and an archives. And as you can see, it's kind of catty corner across the street. The house is there to the left and then catty corner up there uh, to the right, sorry, and then category, catty corner to the left is the new site. And so here you can see the house is now on the left and the new site is on the right and beside all the things that we wanted to do to of course make the building sustainable and park-like, we, we, we also wanted it to be a beacon in the neighborhood that allowed people to connect to the story that Louis Armstrong was really this explosive giant of talent. And he was a regular person, but he wasn't a regular creator. And so we wanted this to be a building that somehow conveyed both of those things across the street from his house and was visible not only frontally here, but uh, especially from the diagonal view coming up and down the street. Many of the visitors come either by bus or walk over six blocks from the subway. And we wanted this building almost to glow, especially at night. And so we made, we made these, this counter, this curve and this counter curve. And our wonderful client, Michael Cogswell, who alas was one of the first people to die in COVID. But he, he absolutely encouraged us to keep on finding any time we made something that Michael thought connected to music and to Lewis's art, he got excited and he encouraged us, encouraged us to do more. And we also had many, many meetings with people in the neighborhood who curiously are a new generation of people. They're mostly Korean American and Hispanic American and they, they don't have the same history as Lewis, but they're excited that Lewis lived there in their neighborhood. And so we started to really think about the materiality uh, and we started to create this brass um, at, the, at the underside of the curving roof and we created a custom mesh, a custom brass woven mesh inside the glass because of course sustainable, a sustainable cool interior that the architecture does most of the work that you don't have to have mechanical equipment doing the bulk of the work is very important. And that also gave us a material that, that reflects this kind of materiality. So I apologize for the Johnnies on the spot, but it's still under construction. Uh, but you can start to see this curve and you can see now this week the brass is in and you can kind of see how it's meant to bring you in. And then our intentions again in this interior of the building is to create, even though it's small and contextual, is to create a memorable set of spaces that center around this experience. So here we are uh, coming into the building uh, last week. And you can see how the light cuts through it and how it kind of creates um, movement. And then you come into this exhibit, which uh, is made by a wonderful a bunch of creatives, uh, uh, CNG and Potion. Uh, to that's all kinds of different forms of interactivity. But you can also see this door, and this door leads you into a special space. And of course, when you get something like a program, it has a classic uh, architect's terms on it. So 
when we got the program, it said multi-purpose space, which is always, you know, it's a dessert topping and a floor wax kind of one of those situations. And we said for this space, what we were talking with our client, Michael, we said, really, this needs to be a jazz club. And Michael got very excited, and we went with him to all kinds of jazz clubs in New York, all, uh, a tour of New York's basements, among other things. <laughs> and so we wanted to create a jazz club here that a lifelong jazz fan or musician or a little eight-year-old kid that knew nothing about jazz, would that the lifelong denizens would recognize as a place for jazz and for the little kid, it was like an introduction to what that was. And here it is, uh, starting to be prepared for occupancy. And even as you're coming from the green room, uh, hopefully it'll speak to you. And as you leave the museum and you look back up at this great glass canopy, hopefully it'll convey something to you of the spirit of Louis Armstrong. So that's a little bit about our work, and I thank you. He's our answer man. You're the answer man? He's the answer man. <laughs> no. <laughs> we both answer. Do you okay. have a question or Let's go. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I was wondering, through your work, it's evident that you have an incredible sensitivity and respect for cultures that are historically ignored. I'm just wondering, is there a consistent aspect to your kind of, like how you approach a project that you do to maintain this sensitivity? Well, I'll start at a lot of mistakes. So we, the consistent approach is that we try to meet with people a lot, and both formally but also informally. Because some people are happy to go to a group meeting and be the loud voice, but some, the, many of the voices that you have to hear to learn something are much more modest, and so you have to kind of bring them into a relationship. Um, and as I explained earlier, we try so hard to hear, but so often our preconceptions, our own training, our own acculturation is like this screen that makes us deaf, that makes us stupid. And those moments where somebody is kind enough to point out to us that we're still not getting it and points out to us some of the things that we're not getting are very often the moments that are the moments of artistic creativity for us where we see something that we did not see before. Well, it's, it's almost like every encounter you have. You know, there's a moment when you come and then there's this moment of transition. And then either you move forward or you move backwards. But understanding that atmosphere is what leads to then trust and ideas. And all of these projects are based on ideas, uh, people's ideas about their space and ideas about how they think they live. And getting to that point, that point sometimes happen easily, but sometimes take quite a bit of struggle to get to it. And, and that's just the beginning, because then the formal part, the architectural part, tectonic part, then that's a, another transition. So it's, it, it, it's really, Louis Armstrong was an easier project because the, the director was someone in tune with, with music and art. The, the state agency that was handling the project could care less. So it was just getting these two groups of people together to kind of see was, uh, took like six months. At least. Several schemes we had to produce to get to that point. 